Welcome back, y'all. Welcome back to the World Club Podcast. My name is Mandy, and my co-host is, you know, this guy that I met once or twice. Well, what's your name again, man? She picked me up on the side of the road. My uh, name is Michael Moore. Oh, my God. <laughs> he just made me sound so horrible. <laughs> Oh my God. All right, guys, we have been gone for a while. We we know that we recognize that, but there's been a lot going on life-wise, business-wise. There's been some major, major changes for us. Um, Major. Yeah, it's, it's been a lot and a lot all at once. Um, those of you who follow our other channels or our Twitch or any of that, you know, Michael started school a few years ago. He's getting close to graduation. And he also just accepted a new job. He made a major career leap <laughs> that has changed things for us drastically. You want to kind of fill him in? Oh, yes. It has made some extreme changes. And, and speaking of the graduation, I'll graduate before I'm 25. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll bite my tongue and I'll let him. I'll let him have his delusion. A delusion is yeah, that doesn't even sum it up. But anyway, <laughs> he's really trying to make me a cradle robber. <laughs> yeah, later this month I will graduate. Uh, let's see, I can't remember the exact date, but uh, it's in uh, in about two weeks, I think. Um, and that will be. A chapter of the book closed. Uh, as Mandy said, did start another job, which uh, actually the first part of this job is working. It's working for a contractor um, in IT. And the first part of the job is actually 10 weeks of boot camp style training. So I've been doing that on top of the schoolwork, which is equal uh, pretty much 20 hour days for the past four or five weeks. Yeah. Uh, I think this is the first evening that I've taken to do anything other than schoolwork or work work or study uh, in about four or five weeks. <laughs> so, uh, of course, with changing careers, it's been a, a financial shift as well. Um, kind of in order to make that change, I had to to give up what I was uh, making before. And and but, y'all, we we were scared about that. I mean, oh yes, we we yes, were. It, I didn't want to show it to him because I wanted him to make this change because sometimes to go after what you dream of, you have to give up a little something to start off with. But in the long run, it pays off and. That was what I had in my head, and I didn't want to show him I was scared and make him second guess doing it. Oh, I second guessed every second of it because <laughs> <laughs> I knew what I was doing. But, um, but of course, changing changing careers was a significant impact on the financial situation. But um, with that said, it so far it's definitely been worth it. Uh, but like I say once I get through this boot camp style training, hopefully things will settle out a little bit. It's it's been quite the overload, I guess you would say. Um, I went from within four weeks not knowing what the technology was. I knew the name, but I had no clue what it was. To passing my first certification, uh, yes, exam. So that's that's a lot to to absorb in four weeks <laughs> uh, all of that while dealing with the financial changes and while trying to keep his grades up to graduate and do all the things he needed to do for school and trying to help me build sam stars creations we are reworking it um we've always had a vision for sam stars and that vision is for it to be something that not only benefits us and our immediate family, but benefits our extended family, which we consider a lot of our online community to be. Um, something where eventually we can provide paying jobs. And we've already started trying to implement that some and trying to kind of push, if you will, people in our online community to, to go after their passions as well and do what we can to help them with that. But we want to expand it and do it on a grander scale. Um, 
we're actually going to be doing a Patreon video. We're supposed to have done it a while back about what we're going to be doing. And I think we're going to put it on all the channels, you think, Michael? So that anybody can catch it anywhere? Yeah, I believe so. And guys, I'm noticing we're having a little bit of audio things going on here. Um, hopefully it won't be too annoying. Uh, and we, we've been saying it for the longest and we haven't gotten to do it yet because life keeps throwing stuff at us. We have new mics. We have a whole room downstairs. We've been setting up for nothing but recording this podcast. We are going to finish getting that set up done this weekend so that we can start with the video podcast, hopefully better audio, all that type of stuff. So she's made a plan. That means the roof of the house is going to fall in or something. <laughs> oh my Lord. <laughs> I'm going to skin him. <laughs> you know, our plans never work out the way they're supposed to. This time it's going to, dang it, one way or the other. <laughs> now, you know, another thing that's been going on, been I've been working on Sandbox. Um, I have missed so many release dates with Sandbox. And a lot of that is because I sat down and I'm like finishing up the final draft and a part of it just won't sound right to me. It won't feel right. And I have a bad habit of when that happens, instead of just fixing that part, scrapping pages upon pages upon pages. And, you know, it it's a process. So, but... <laughs> yeah, I, I'm getting more and more picky with my writing. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, but I do know I can be obsessive at times. And I'm trying to break that habit too but sandbox is almost ready um aspen hill is well underway but the release date for it was supposed to have been valentine's day uh, well possibly i said possibly so i didn't actually promise on that one but it's going to be a little bit longer because i'm collecting information and pictures from people that lived in aspen hill so and i've got the hearts and stars series started um got the first two books in it going i'm not sure when i have those finished but they should be out by fall so a thousand and one irons in the fire by mandy collins <laughs> yeah that's it so the, 40 yards of the outhouse by willie may <laughs> <laughs> you know that that we've had that going on we've had family stuff going on um in, in particular our dog winter and again, if a lot of you have been around our other channels, our Twitches, you know Winter is our husky. She's one of our babies. And um, not long ago, she suddenly got ill and went blind just like overnight. And then she's been having some other health issues. And for a little bit there, we thought we were going to lose her. So it got to where we were almost like sleeping in shifts. So one of us could be up with her all the time. And stuff like that and she she's on the men now she's slowly very slowly getting better but it's not as bad as it was but it's not as good as it should be so that was another thing that was worrying us and i know a lot of people say it's just a dog well you believe that if you want to <laughs> but to us our fur babies are family and family's going to come first always so you know if you don't like it, maybe you're in the wrong place. And right now I got a little foot warmer. Well, I wouldn't say little, but. <laughs> I was about to say Bravo, our, <sighs> our little tweeny. He is in here on my foot. Winter is in over there with Michael on his foot. So. Yep. yep. <laughs> they're, yep. they're spoiled babies. And the cats are roaming around looking at us like, well, what about us? So. Mm -hmm. I honestly thought about setting up a cat cam for my Twitch streams. You know, that way, because I know... You see how bad they are. Yeah, because I know Miss Grid, <laughs> Miss Neely is always encouraging Tuesday to do something mean to me during streams, you know. So that way she could actually <laughs> see her doing it. <laughs> yep. And we do have some new stuff planned and coming up for the podcast channel, as well as our gaming side of stuff. I've been working very hard on... A uh, project for ARC here lately. Um, it's actually an idea my our granddaughter gave me. So, yes, I'm taking 
content advice <laughs> from a two-year-old. So, <laughs> but she's a very smart, very beautiful two-year-old. Don't, yes, she is. Don't believe me? I'm going to throw in some, some pictures for those of you catching this on YouTube. Well, I guess I can do this on Spotify now, too. But anyway, so, some pictures of Michael and her at Christmas and Michael playing Santa for her at Christmas. Yep. Yeah, we we <laughs> loved, we did, you know, take a few days there at Christmas just to enjoy family. Um, went back to Tennessee for a couple of days to spend time with family and you know my dad used to play the Santa bit for the grandkids and he's he's had some surgeries and some bad health issues the past several months but I knew he still had that costume there so I didn't even tell Michael what I was doing I just called him back to the bedroom and I shoved the Santa suit at him I'm like put this on like here stick this on you're doing this I didn't tell daddy I was doing it, nothing. And daddy, when Michael walked out, at first I was almost worried daddy would get a little upset because that's always been his role. And she didn't tell me this part, <laughs> him not knowing. But he he looked at me and he, he said, I wasn't expecting that. But he said it with the biggest grin on his face. Daddy <laughs> has always been very picky and critical of anybody in my life. But it's a big sign of endorsement that he actually likes Michael. So <laughs> it worked out good. You know, Daddy was happy somebody did Santa for the little ones. And our little bug got to see. Oh, y'all should have seen her. It was so priceless. She was, she was sitting there talking to my dad and somebody else. I can't remember who it was. But she's talking to them. And so she wasn't paying any attention to Michael or me or anything. And he walks up behind her and she finally turns around. She sees him and she looks at him and just lights up. And then she leans over to my dad real quiet and goes, that's ho ho. <laughs> <laughs> it was so cute. <laughs> she was just tickled as she could be. So that, that was a good thing going on. So And, and had no clue that it was me, supposedly. I, I yeah, still think she, she's bluffing us. I, 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 she acted like she had no clue. I just knew for sure when she heard your voice, she was going to pick up on, hey, this is Papa. But it, it didn't seem like she did to me. Yeah, I tried my best to change my voice so maybe she wouldn't pick up on it. So I still don't see how I pulled it off, though. She's way too smart for that. <laughs> uh oh. Re repeat that. Um, somehow my thing got muted. I still don't see how she how I pulled that off because she's way too smart for that. Yeah. She is smart, but she you got to realize she's still a two-year-old little baby. As much as she yeah. wants to think she's 20, she's only two. 19. <laughs> <laughs> I think she graduates high school next week. Yeah. Oh, y'all, like y'all, she this kid kills me. It will tickle me to death that she'll call me. And I'll answer the phone, and I'll be like, hi, little bug, I love you. She'd be like, Papa. <laughs> and it's like, really? You you called me just to get him on the phone. That's uh, more like, <sighs> Papa. Yeah, that's the way she says it, Papa. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes, in the case you're wondering, this child could commit murder, and he would help her cover it up. Yep, just need to know how big, how, how big to dig the hole, you know. <laughs> Why dig a hole? There's plenty of swamp land around here. Yep. Much easier to get rid of a body. And y'all didn't hear none of this. I, I probably need to cut speaking, all of this out. <laughs> speaking of our local FBI agent, I uh, hope y'all are doing well today. <laughs> we're about we to are be just under, joking. <laughs> yeah, I was say, we're about to be under investigation for every unsolved crime in the area. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> That's probably quite a long list. I don't know. I really don't know. I hadn't really, really checked into it. I have to check into that sometime. I don't think I want to. <laughs> <laughs> now, guys, there is something. There may be some changes where the podcast goes. We're not for certain yet. Um, I'm sure a lot of you may have heard about the Joe Rogan Spotify controversy going on. And... It, it gives us mixed feelings about staying on Spotify and with Anchor and 
important. Spotify. Anchor is great for starting a podcast. There is no doubt. Spotify, one of the biggest platforms there is. And I admire what Spotify had to say. You know, we believe in free speech for everybody. And me and Michael agree with that. It it shouldn't be that you pull Joe Rogan just because you don't like him or because he had a difference of opinion than you. The problem we have with it is he, this goes beyond free speech. He is, he has deliberately put out misinformation that could affect someone's health, that can affect a whole society based on who listens to him. So, um, that's where we have the issue and where we're having a little conflict. And which he, he himself, if I'm not mistaken, has said, you know, whatever you do, don't take, you know, advice, medical advice from me or whatever, you know, but at the same time, the diehard fans are going to take everything you say to heart. And that, so, that's the problem for me is he, he says, you know, I'm no doctor, I'm no scientist, but then yet spews this stuff out of his mouth like he is a doctor or a scientist knowing that he has this huge platform and this huge audience that's going to listen to him. So we kind of, eh, we're kind of debating on what direction we're going to take from here. And because like I said, we, we believe in free speech for everybody, but when you're deliberately putting out false facts, misinformation that could affect somebody's health, or life. Yeah. It, it, I mean, we we take issue with that. Yeah. So. This is some serious stuff we're dealing with. I mean, it's no joke. No, it, it's not. And um, I'm, I'm tired of seeing people act like it is. I have, I've known people that have died from this mess. I have almost lost family and friends from this mess. I have family and friends that are still dealing dealing with the after effects of this mess. And before anybody comes at me with this bullshit, oh, I bet they had a pre-existing condition. I can tell you right now, my beautiful 20-year-old niece had no pre-existing any damn thing before COVID. So don't. This stuff affects more than people with pre-existing conditions. It affects so many. And yes, there are people that are still getting it after being vaccinated. People, for those of you yelling about that, no vaccine, none, none ever that has ever been made is 100%. It does not happen. It is not scientifically possible. So please zip it with that crap. You know what I mean? They've been saying that it doesn't, it doesn't protect you from necessarily getting it. It just reduces the effects. And it reduces the risk of death. And, uh, you know, that yeah. that's one of the biggest things. And I just want people to take it more serious. Whether you want to get vaccinated or not, take how you're handling it and what you say and the consequences for how you handle it and what you say more seriously. That yeah. That's all. Okay, my rant is over for now. <laughs> um, this seems like a good time to insert a little bit from our sponsors here. So we'll see y'all back here in just a minute. To you. Michael, sh- should we tell them about Anchor? Uh, absolutely. Okay, guys, let me tell y'all about Anchor. And yes, this is sponsored, but I would be saying this even if they weren't our sponsor. Anchor is... If you have not heard about them, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Number one, it's free. Okay, absolutely free. Free is always good. Oh, free is fantastic. Especially if you go to comparing the prices of some of the, the software and the platforms for podcasts. When you're just starting out, it can really get on up there. So when you're just starting a podcast, if you've ever thought about it, by all means, check out Anchor because number one, it's free. Number two, it really simplifies the process a great deal. You've got all the tools that you would need to allow you to record and edit a podcast right from your phone or your computer. The interface is incredibly easy and You know, say you want to do an audio version and a video version of your podcast. 
but you don't want to have to fool with having all these separate files and this, that, and the other. No worries. Set down, turn on your camera, record the thing, and Anchor will separate the audio from the video for you. So then you can have your audio version and your video version. At just all around, it's a great way if you're looking at starting a podcast to get up and running, just hit the ground, running full steam right out of the gate. So by all means, absolutely go check out Anchor and it's A-N-C-H-O-R, just like, you know, Anchor to a Ship. Very easy to find. Look it up, check it out. We'll include links in our descriptions. It just, you know, go take a look at it. I'm pretty sure you'll find it's going to be one of your best options to get up and going. Okay. Simple and free. You really don't have much to lose there. Exactly. Exactly. No, absolutely nothing to lose. So go give it a shot. Another sponsor we have today is, as always, as every day, is CM Stars Creations, our parent company. One of the best ways you can support us, go over, check out the CM Stars Creations website at cmstarscreations.com and you'll find a lot of great merchandise, some, you know, directly related to the podcast, as well as some that's, you know, centered around my channel, around Michael's channel, uh, just a variety of things, including some handmade goods such as wine glasses, candles, things of that nature that fall under our homestead farm and gifts side of CM Stars. So make sure you go over there, check out CM Stars Creations. Again, that is cmstarscreations.com. Folks, if you really want to support the podcast, there are a number of ways to do that. You're doing run one right now just by listening. That's always always a great way to support but if you're looking to take that support you know that that little extra mile there are a number of ways to do that and there is a link to give you that number of ways simply head over to our website worldscollidepodcast.com and head over to the support tab there you'll find a whole list of ways to support us whether it be Patreon, one-time donations, monthly subscriptions, uh, shopping on CM Stars Creations, subbing on YouTube, listening, following, following on Twitter, following on Instagram, or checking out me or Michael on any of our socials or our websites. You will find links for every bit of that. And I assure you, no matter how you choose to show your support for us and the world's collide podcast we are ever so grateful no one form of support is more important than the other they are all equally important and equally appreciated so thank you very much and again head over to worldscollidepodcast.com all right guys we are back and um unfortunately we got to talk about one of my least favorite subjects in the world. I thought you were saying, unfortunately, we're back. <laughs> oh, well, it is unfortunate we're back with this subject. And I, I honestly debated for a couple of weeks now about even discussing this, but I think it needs to be discussed. Um, it's Adam McIntyre again, y'all. Yay! Yay! Yeah. Uh, this time, Adam did Everybody something. Give him the Oh, yeah, that's slow. <laughs> but, yeah, this time Adam went after somebody we happen to love and admire a lot, Mr. Rich Lux. And the fact that we love and admire him really doesn't make a difference in this. Um, as a matter of fact, Rich is part of the reason I debated on even covering this. Because he didn't want a lot of hate slung at Adam. He didn't want a lot of people going after him. And that's not really particularly what I want to do right now. I just, it goes back to something we discussed about Adam in a previous podcast where he had taken a borderline homophobic tweet 
about Shane Dawson and retweeted it just because he was so anxious to get at Shane. And, you know, we had discussed that it just kind of showed he doesn't research things. He doesn't look into the context of things as long as he can use it to stir crap and go after somebody. And what he did... Get his name out there. Yeah, exactly. It's all for clicks and views. He doesn't care if it's truthful. He doesn't care what it really (laughs) is. And this situation with Rich just kind of proved that. He, um, somebody had sent him this tweet that was uh, consisted of a video where somebody had taken one of Rich's old videos and put it way out of context. It, It was, it was, it was horrible what they did with it. And he did not bother to research it. He admitted in his so-called apology video, which was a very backhanded apology. I'm still not sure. Excuse my cat over there making noises, y'all. She's letting me know her bowl is empty. (laughs) (laughs) How dare you? She just ate an hour and a half ago. Keep that in mind. (laughs) But um, he, he admitted he did not do the research on this. So to me, it's just, solidifies more what we said before about he does not care as long as he gets the clicks and the views and to me that is dangerous especially when you have a large platform I I don't see how he can do that and and have a conscience about him I, it just it's not right. It is so wrong. And once you label someone a racist, well, I don't know if you call it a racist. Uh, the clip was taken out of context and, and misconstrued and rearranged to make it look like Rich was saying racism was okay. Which is not what yeah. he was doing. And Ridiculous. I, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not going to include... Any clips from Rich's video on this subject or Adam's supposed apology. But I will include a link below to Rich's video on the situation. Uh, I Actually, I think he did two videos on it. So I'm going to include those below. I want you guys to go check them out for yourself and see what actually transpired. But what do you guys think? Is it dangerous for a large creator or any creator for that matter to just take something and throw it out there without doing their homework and their research and knowing what they're really putting out there. Especially in the, you know, this time of cancel culture, I guess you would say, um, I guess that's still a, a real thing, but I mean, people, I don't know. It's like people are quick to jump from to one side or the other. Um, no, with, uh, without a doubt. I mean, I don't know. I, I just, I can't see putting somebody's career at jeopardy just for shits and giggles, for lack of a better word. Well, and, and not just their career, just their overall reputation and, you know. Well-being. Yeah. <laughs> their their mental health, everything. And you, could, you can tell by the the video that Rich put out, it, it, it cut him deep. Yeah, it, it did. I could understand that. It's it. You could tell by his reaction that it it was definitely not what he wanted, or what you know something that he would want people to to view him as, um, or to think that he was you know promoting that. So, well, and you know, a lot of times, me and Rich kind of have the same train of thought on a lot of things but we differed on this because he was willing to accept Adam's apology and I really did not want him to he was being the bigger better person yes but my train of thought on this was okay if this was something Adam had done once you could say it was a mistake but this is a pattern with him more than once it's not a mistake anymore it is deliberate and it is a pattern and not to mention when you put butts in your apologies oh yeah yeah that's not an apology no no it's not i don't know what that is but it's not an apology no you can't say oh you know well i shouldn't have done this i'm sorry but 
it doesn't work that way. Either you're sorry or you're not. There's no but. There's no, it's it's not conditional. Exactly. Exactly. And I don't, I don't know. The mo- I think one of the most disappointing things about Adam McIntyre to me is he is a cute kid. And I say kid. I know he's a young man. He, he To me, he's a kid, you know, because I'm old enough to be his mama. But he's a cute kid full of charisma. He seems very intelligent. He could be doing so much good with his platform. And instead, he chooses to go the bitchy, underhanded route. And that's disappointing to me because, Adam, sweetheart, you're more than that. You just need to realize it. And I'm sorry, but hanging around with Cat isn't going to do you any good either. So... But that's just my thoughts. <laughs> Michael sitting there like, oh, no, she's going to do yeah, it again. She's getting wound up. <laughs> I stopped. I stopped. Now, we're talking about youngins, right? Mm-hmm. Guess who's having a youngin? Huh? Trisha Paytas is pregnant. <laughs> Yeah, guys, I know we have talked a lot of crap about Trisha. Do we like Trisha? No. Do we agree with anything Trisha does? No. Well, there might have been that one time. (laughs) (laughs) Now, for the most part, no. But a baby should be something that can be celebrated and be joyous. And so we do congratulate her on that. And, um... I've been watching the comments on her Instagram, on her Twitter, and um, for every one positive comment she's getting about this baby, she's getting like 10 negative. Um, so um, Time to pull the punches, people. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it, as Plain much as simple. we dislike her, this is not the time to put a pregnant woman through hell. It's just not. Um, I had already thought about this and... Then I saw a few other creators, you know, saying the same thing. And I'm glad there are others saying it and looking at it that way. I myself miscarried before pregnancies. And so I know that pain and I would never wish it on another woman, even Trisha Paytas. So as for us, we are not going to do anything that will contribute to her stress any kind of mental health issues, anything. Unless it is something incredibly major, we're not going to really be covering any Trisha Paytas stuff until after this baby is born and is healthy. And uh, one creator that I saw, you know, kind of thinking along the same lines was, again, Rich Lux. And he, he, he voiced something that I had considered. Um, that, maybe this baby will change her for the better and that is a good possibility before I got pregnant with our oldest son I was not the person I am now put it that way and even after I had him I still it still took years of evolving to get to where I am now but I was a particularly shitty person before that first pregnancy (laughs) and um, my son a lot of times I credit him with being the reason I'm still here and being the one who put me on the path to changing my life around. So that's understandable. I mean, I was pretty shitty and off the beaten path before I got pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, guys, I was about to take a drink of sun drop and he just had to spout that off. Oh my word. Yeah. But, yeah, so all we're going to say on the Trisha Paytas pregnancy is congrats, Trisha, congrats, Moses, and we're wishing you a very easy and healthy pregnancy and delivery. Absolutely. So that's all we've got to say on that. Now. That's all I've got to say about that. (laughs) (laughs) I, I think I got plenty more to say on the Peter Mon situation, though. 
Peter Mon. Yeah. Um, a lot of you may know who Peter Mon is. He's basically... Oh, I have a... no idea. <laughs> He's, he's basically a, a drama YouTuber, um, pretty big platform. He was recently in an accident, and Peter is one of those that 99% of the time, I do not agree with what he has to say. And I have seen him a lot of times put out his opinions or theories as fact against other youtubers with absolutely no evidence no proof and it infuriates the hell out of me but which once again is not right no it's not right and unfortunately and i say unfortunately because even though i don't like him doing it i don't like it being done to him either right now that's being done to him a lot of people are speculating that the wreck was his fault and one person did die in this accident and people are accusing him of being a murderer claiming that he was uh possibly drunk or high something along those lines i i i, I just saw a few of the comments and the tweets and stuff and i i couldn't go on reading them because people as much as i don't like peter doing that to other people it should not be done to him either the man is laying in a hospital right now there is a family mourning the loss of a loved one and all y'all could do is get bitchy and evil what the hell's wrong with y'all yeah really uh, i mean there's a time I mean, and place for everything and this ain't it sis yeah i mean you know it's it's like man and i were talking earlier it, going after people or misrepresenting stuff or what whatnot you know creating drama bs whatever telling that's point blank lies yeah telling point blank lies that's one thing don't agree with any of it don't get me wrong but this is life or death yes th Th there's no comparison this is a two. petty youtube drama this somebody literally died peter's life was in danger last i saw he was still in critical condition there were other people taken to the hospital involved in this wreck and y'all want to come out with your bullshit. And I, I tried. I, I went online and I tried finding anywhere that the police have said Peter caused this, that Peter was drunk, he was high, anything. I cannot find that. And it may turn out that that was the case. But as it stands right now, there's nothing saying that. At least there wasn't when I looked into all this, what, an hour, two hours ago, Michael? Yeah, something like that. It's about an hour ago. So, why make up? You are... All right, for, for people that didn't know who Peter Mon was, if they have seen all this crap put out there, then from now on, every time they hear his name, that's what they're going to associate it with. With something horribly negative and that he did something bad. You are damaging someone's life and reputation with unfounded unproven claims grow the hell up people I, mm, that crap just annoys the hell out of me it annoys me when peter does it and it shouldn't be done being done to him too just point blank nobody should be putting out unproven bullshit that's true yeah it's um uh... <clears throat> it looks like from from the looks of it, it says that uh his Jeep Grand Cherokee was uh, in the center of the road when the event occurred and also struck a, a uh, Nissan Altima. So I mean, but like I say, who, who knows what happened there? Yeah, and until, until they re released the you know what was going on, I mean, it could have been a health issue. I, yeah, you know, hopefully not. But I mean, it may have been a heart attack going down the road. Who knows? Could have been anything. Yeah, and uh, until we do know, there there shouldn't be putting out all the speculation, much less putting it out as friggin' fact. I have seen some people putting it out as fact. Um, I saw one heifer, and if I can find the tweet again, I should have screenshotted it earlier. If I can find the tweet again, she had photoshopped and doctored his Twitter profile for it to say "I kill men." 
people in the comment section on that calling him a murderer. People, grow the fuck up. This ain't high school no more. Oh my God, these people infuriate me with their bull. And I don't even like Peter. But there's right and there's wrong, no matter who it pertains to. And this is wrong. So, Peter, best wishes. Hope you make a full recovery. And much as I disagree with you on stuff, I hope to see you back doing your thing soon. Uh oh, yeah. I, I see Michael. Michael's researching something. Oh God, yeah, help us! Yeah, I was I was looking to see if I could find any new information. Uh, not really, not really uh finding anything. Yeah, it just it's a sad situation right now, and for people to put out speculation as facts just turns it from sad and tragic to. I, I don't even know what to call it, but it's just horrible, and, and people need to stop. Seriously. Yep. I totally agree. Uh, all right. We have talked enough, about enough bad and sad and... Mad. Yeah. I want to talk about something that has all of those elements in one. <laughs> Yay! We want to talk about the Super Bowl halftime show, y'all. You know, I I have seen so many reactions to this online, and for those of you who may not know, um, this two trailer park girls going around the outside. Oh, <laughs> can y'all tell already? We're fans. Okay, <laughs> ain't gonna lie. <laughs> But this year we had Dre, Snoop, Mary J. Blige. Oh, and can we just say Mary was looking fine as hell. That woman's <laughs> body. Oh, my God. I'm jealous as hell. Anyway, let me get over my jealousy. <laughs> uh, we had 50 Cent, Kendrick Lamar, and Eminem all on stage together. And for those of us who grew up on all their music, this was, I'm not going to say it was the best Super Bowl halftime show ever because there was another one that ranked just as high, in my opinion, and that was Prince. So let's, you know, we cannot forget <laughs> about the purple one. No, but this one was right up there with Prince. And I swear to God, it brought back so many good memories. And a lot of this music, well, like Lose Yourself, from Eminem. I, some of y'all that are part of our little online community and stuff. Y'all know that I listen to music a lot of times while I'm writing. I have a hard time writing without music or something in the background. And I have a writing playlist. And Lose Yourself is on that playlist. That song. I seem to write so much better when that song is playing. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was just it was amazing and for them to throw a little pock in there rest his soul it just to me it was freaking phenomenal it was the only reason to watch the Super Bowl for me but then again I'm more of a college football fan not a pro fan and yeah I will go ahead and say it right now loud and proud there you go. roll tide roll tide but is that Auburn Oh, oh, don't make me kill oh, you I'm in sorry. your sleep. <gasps> oh, oh, <yeah>. Ew. <laughs> Ew. Nasty. If you want to know what her favorite team is, it's the big T. Oh, my God. He is so lying to y'all. That's my daddy's he favorite. He loves Tennessee. Okay, this is getting off topic from what we were supposed to be talking about. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, <laughs> but uh, growing up... um. Daddy was always a Vols fan. I was always a Bama fan. So game time was not particularly healthy in our household. <laughs> and I remember, was it 92? It's either 92 or 93. Bama handed Tennessee their butts. And I was over there watching it with Daddy. I, you know, at that point I had moved out on my own, was doing my own thing. But I went over there and was watching that. And, you know, of course I'm going to gloat. 
My daddy tells me to get out of his house and not come back. <laughs> and of course, you know, after he had a day or two to calm down, it was all good again. But that's how serious we could get over college football at one time. <laughs> It was not, it was not healthy, but our, our whole family is that way. We are, our whole family is divided. Half of us are Bama fans, half of us are Vols fans, and there's no in between. The only thing we all agree on is we all hate Auburn. Well, I was going to say we all hate Auburn, but there's Lisa. <laughs> Shout out my cousin Lisa, more like my sister, but she's, she's a poor little eyeball of the group. We don't know what happened to her. She just fell way off the apple tree somehow, way out over in the left pasture. We don't know how she got over there. One of these. I'll have you know, there was a time that Tennessee and Alabama tied at six to six. Don't even. No, no, no. no. Just chit chit. It, it was in 1901. <laughs> 1903, though, Tennessee, uh, Alabama beat Tennessee 24 to zero. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, wait, wait a minute hang on Let, let's see uh 1903 1904 1905 1906 1907 1908 1909 1912 and 1913 tennessee had zero <laughs> yeah they they didn't come out of the gate real well god please don't let my daddy listen to this podcast <laughs> <laughs> Oh, please. 19, 1914. It took them 14 years before they got their first win. 17 to 7, and then they beat them in 28. But it's a little closer to modern day. <laughs> you got to give it to Tennessee fans, though. They are some of the most loyal, diehard, no matter how many times they lose. They <laughs> are still sporting that orange and singing Rocky Top. Let's talk so, about 1995. Oh, fuck. 41 cup, to 14, Tennessee. Cup, puck you. I remember that year. It was <laughs> bull. Just shush. That year As never happened. Fact, that year never happened. As a matter of fact, Tennessee got on a roll there. Uh, yeah, actually, 96, they did. 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 2000, and 2001. Tennessee won. And what's happened every year since? Uh, let's see. Uh, let's come up to 2020. Uh, let's see. From 2007 to 2020, Alabama's won. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the one thing. 2000, 2005, Alabama vacated. What the hell that, the hell that mean? I had to go back and look that up and see what happened. Well, one thing I do, I do have to give my family, you know, even though we have poor little Lisa, that's the oddball Auburn fan, um, at least to my knowledge, we have no LSU fans in the family. Thank you, sweet baby Jesus. We're good. <laughs> and now I'm going to have LSU fans everywhere going, what'd she say? Sorry, y'all. Just my opinion. <laughs> love your team if you want. We all love our teams. It's Just all record, good. It. For the record, I am totally neutral. I love picking on Mandy about football, but I have not watched football since uh, maybe 14 years old. <laughs> oh, no, no. You got to take that back. Other than maybe at like the Christmas dinner or something like that. No, no, no. Um, or Thanksgiving, whichever. Scott. Not going to say just, his last name. It's just because there may or may not have been somebody that I know <laughs> that may have had a wager. Okay, of guys. Some form. All right. Here, here's the story behind that. I was a bartender, and one of our regulars, a guy named Scott, he was pretty much everybody at that bar. Honestly, was a big Tennessee fan. I was like the only Alabama fan. So come game day, I was catching crap. You know. I'd come in there, be the only one in my crimson in a sea of freaking orange in this place. Uh, that year, me... That's not an understatement. No, it's, <laughs> it's not. It, yeah, I didn't get killed. But, um, Scott, he was more diehard orange than most. And he was just giving me crap, giving me crap, giving me crap. And so, finally, I made a bet with him that... If Tennessee won, 
what was it? I was supposed to wear that ugly Tennessee shirt he had? Something like that, yeah. And if Bama won, he was supposed to wear a tutu and dance on the bar while waving my Alabama flag. All right, just to make sure this was all good and legal-like, we wrote it out on a bar napkin. Actually had Michael write it out. and he yeah, it's was like the music industry. He, he signed it as our witness and was going to hold us both to it. Game day comes. All of a sudden, Scott's not at the bar. He's at the bar every other day. Where was he that day? And I call him and I'm like, where are you? Oh, I'm on a date. We'll bring her here. I'd love to meet her and love to let her in on this wager. I kind of find out it was a girl I knew. So it was easy for me to convince her to tell him, you know, yeah, let's go up there to the bar. <laughs> so they come and Alabama hands Tennessee their butt. You know, he still has not paid up on that bet. On that bet. So Scott C., if you hear this, you know who you are. You know what this is about. You still owe me. <laughs> I want to see that pink tutu and you waving that little Alabama flag. I still got the flag, dang it. And video will work. I mean, it yeah. doesn't have to be in person. Yeah, video will work <laughs> fine, Scott. Come on. Pay up. Be a man. Honor your bets. All right. Anyway, we're supposed to be talking about the Super Bowl <laughs> halftime show. <laughs> anyway, Thank y'all. I was sorry. We uh, went way over yonder somewhere. You went way over. I just spouted out a few scores. Oh, know, you there. were you were agging me on, and you know it. I took a boat paddle and stuck it right in the studio. <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> but uh, seriously, though, the, the Super Bowl halftime, I think for a lot of us from our generation, was just phenomenal and these performers all of them even though that you know they're much older than what they were when they first came out and first you know their careers really exploded they were still on point with everything they were true professionals true artists but then I see so many people online. Oh, it was crap. Oh, it was blah, 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 blah. Okay, if it's not your genre, I get that. That's fine. Everybody has their favorite genre. But just because it wasn't your favorite genre doesn't mean that they're not good performers, that they're not good artists, that they don't have talent. And I saw so many people saying that. And that's just absolutely ridiculous. I saw a lot of people calling them washed up has beens. Okay, for <laughs> all of you that wanted to say that, let me just ask how are your record sales this month? When's <laughs> the last time that many people stood up on their feet and couldn't quit moving to your music? Yeah, yeah, because it seemed to be quite a bit of the crowd that enjoyed it. I mean, I. I, I've I've read the stuff about you know how so many people hated it da, da 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 this that and the other. I'm trying to figure out who those people were because I didn't see any of them. But um, yeah, and and don't get me wrong, you know I've never been a real big fan of the genres of music that they were doing. And as a lot of you know, I'm you know I was a musician still. Well, I say was a musician once a musician always a musician. But yeah, um, <laughs> I played for several years. And in the time that I played, it was total opposite. Um, everything from rock to metal to, I mean, the heavy shit. Yeah. You know, the, the heavier, the better. The faster, the better. The harder, the better, you know. But so it, it would be natural to assume that I would look at it and go, oh, them guys ain't got no talent. That's bullshit. I mean, because it's sit down and try to make what they make. Sit down and record it yourself. Yep. Just, I mean, it's it's simple. All you got to do is record it, you know, and and master it, and you know, there's software out there that makes it simple now. Have talent to start with. Yeah. You know. oh, oh, there's there's software out there now that you know takes that aspect. Yeah, right but out. if you, you think can, about it, back when these guys started, you didn't have that software. Well, that's where I was going with that. But even even with the software. You've got to be talented to do that with the software. Yes. 
Yes. It's, it's not something that's talentless that just somebody records it on a phone in their bathroom while they're taking a shower. It don't work that way. Um, there is some talent involved. Are they playing instruments? No. Is learning to play an instrument um, hard? It's hard as hell. One of those. Some. Some are not. Let me rephrase that. I was going to say, you didn't see Dre on that piano? Come on now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had that, and they had a drummer up there, too, and I didn't yeah. really check to see whether or not he was, you know, for show or if he was actually playing. It could have very well been just a choreograph. I mean, but if you think about it, there are a lot of pop, rock, and country bands that the lead singer can't play an instrument at all. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you Definitely. know, it's... And uh, to go along with it, you know, there's a whole lot of bands that, and I know I've seen this getting thrown around, too, about how... It was a backing track, blah, blah, this, that, and the other. Well, I hate to burst your bubble, but a lot of bands yeah. do the exact same thing. They play the backing tracks, then they have a slip up, something skips, something hiccups, or something like that, and then it's all out in the wide open, and everybody acts surprised. Yep. But guess what? A whole lot of artists do that. And it's been that way since forever. <laughs> yes, so. because, and coming from, you know, playing music, it takes time to set everything up, to run sound checks, to get everything equalized, to get everything leveled out, to get, you know, all of that stuff. And you can come back 30 minutes later and it sounds totally different. And you've got to go back through those steps mm -hmm. again. Anybody that's ever played live music knows exactly what I'm talking about. So to to play to a backing track or sing to a backing track or whatever, it's it's understandable. You're talking about something they got to throw together fast. They got to get that stuff out there, get it set up. Bam. One shot. You're, you're not sound checking. You're not. I don't know a band around that would go out and jump on stage, no sound checking, just wing it. Unless yeah. they got a hell of a front of the house man. Yeah. <laughs> Which, and, and you know, Michael comes from one type of musical background. I come from another. Um, my music background isn't as extensive as he is. But I did play piano. I used to sing with a small group I get what he's saying but I also grew up in an area where rap was prevalent among people my age at that time so I grew up with more of an appreciation for rap than I guess a lot of people did and to me I've seen a lot of people call and this has always been a thing crap rap you know, ca call it that because they don't like it. They don't understand it. They don't get it. To me, rap has always been almost like a form of spoken word poetry set to a beat with a little bit of a twist, its own thing in there. And as a writer, that's what gets me. I absolutely love it. And then you put the charisma of people like Dre, Snoop, M, Mary, any of them in there, and you've just got a powder keg waiting to explode, and in a good way. So, for me, I loved it. And even though I saw a lot of people saying they hated it, mainly older people, I also saw, well, um, like this one YouTube channel I like to watch. Uh, Twins is the new trend. Um, these guys kind of really exploded when Dolly Parton um, kind of brought attention to them reacting to one of her songs. Uh, Jolene, I think it was. And them reacting to uh, one of Phil Collins' songs. They, these guys are young. You know, they're young enough to be our kids. And they're reacting to all types and genres of music from over many decades. I love watching these guys. And watching them react to the Super Bowl halftime show. Watching them react to Dre and M and Mary and 50 and Kendrick and just Snoop. All of it. It was, to me, it was a testament to these artists and their work. That they broke through those age boundaries so well with so many people and of course then you had to have the whole controversy over Eminem taking a knee we have thoughts on that too um, I honestly believe that because of the timing of when he took the knee during the show 
that he was probably paying respects to Tupac and possibly Dre at the same time. If you look at the timing of when he did that. A lot of people want to make it political. They want to talk about Colin Kaepernick. Kaepernick excuse me. Um, I don't think it was really about that. But even if it was, a lot of the people I see throwing, throwing the biggest fit about it are the same ones that will yell, Trump should have the right to say anything he wants to say, even if it incites an insurrection. You're all about free speech until it's somebody doing something you don't like. Yeah, that's not the way free speech is supposed to work, people. So, but honestly, I don't think it was a political statement. I think he was paying respect. And that's part of what I love, loved about it. it to me, that was my first thought when I saw him take an E. It wasn't anything political. My first thought was, oh, he's paying respect here. What did you think, Michael? Did you think it was political, or it's kind of it's kind of a tough call because I mean I would like to hear his thoughts on it really and truly. I don't know yeah. if he's if he's said anything about it or not. I haven't had a chance to dig into it and see if he has. Yeah, and, I mean, considering yes, he has a history of supporting uh, Kaepernick and speaking out uh, against people such as Donald Trump. Mm hmm. You know, uh, he's he's had a history of that. He's written in lyrics in his songs about. Oh yes, oh yes. About that, so it's no doubt that he supports that movement. But whether that's what this was about, I don't know. I, I guess I the way really I'm, I, I guess the way I'm looking at it, you know, me and you both have spoken out against a lot of the stuff concerning Trump and that whole situation. But does that mean because we've spoken out on it before that every little thing we do is now politicized? Is it everything we do about politics now? No, it, it doesn't. Just because somebody has a view they've expressed before doesn't mean that that's what everything they do thereafter is about. People are not one-dimensional. So, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm really not sure. Now, one person that really did get under my skin with the absolute bullshit they were spewing on Twitter about this whole situation if, uh, was Nick Adams. For those of y'all who don't know, Nick Adams is a writer, big Trump supporter, and he had a lot of really horrible, nasty stuff to say, and I will insert that part of it anyway somewhere right in here so i wanted to make sure that i did this little video so that all of you know exactly where i stand simply put what we saw last night was an absolute disgrace an abject disgrace any way you look at it any way you want to crack it up it was outrageous it was awful it was disgusting it was terrible it turned off tens of millions of God-fearing patriots who ordinarily love football and can't wait to watch the Super Bowl and celebrate with their family. When I saw Eminem take a knee and essentially give a finger, the finger, to the United States of America, well, that was enough. But then the sight of ex-convicts singing songs with lyrics that were anti-police, that have no kind of positive positive message whatsoever. There are children that watch the Super Bowl. What we saw was most unedifying, without a shadow of a doubt. The choice of those performers, ex-convicts in many instances. What happened to Jason Aldean? What happened to Lee Greenwood? What happened to marching bands? What happened to good old-fashioned heartwarming, patriotic entertainment that the family, the children could enjoy and look up to. That's what was missing last night. I don't want to see a bunch of socialist, anti-American ex-convicts sharing the biggest stage in the world. Why on earth should the NFL be promoting those types of people? What they should be promoting 
are good old fashioned patriotic artists, country music singers, people that love this country, not people that don't like this country and want to take a knee. If you watched the Super Bowl yesterday, I'm sorry to tell you, but you wasted your time. Um, but one of the things he said was that it was nothing but convicts on that stage. Should have had good God fearing patriots like Kid Rock. Excuse you? Hold, <laughs> hold, hold up. You want to talk about convicts and people with criminal records? Okay, don't get me wrong. I, 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 I have loved Kid Rock's music in the past, but um, you really want to go there? Should we start counting up Kid Rock's arrest record? Arrested for assaulting a DJ in a strip club. Arrested for assaulting a patron in a Waffle House. And, and the list goes on. There, there's more. And not to mention, you support, fully, full-on support, a man, Donald Trump, who has had many horrible accusations against him, could be facing criminal charges right now. But you want to yell about these people that were on this stage. And then you made, Nick Adams, you made the most ridiculous, stupid-ass comment. I've heard about this entire thing the whole time. There was absolutely nothing positive in any of those lyrics. Have you listened to the lyrics of Lose Yourself, you son of a... Mm. Have you listened to those lyrics? Because I'm sorry, if you can't look at those as positive and inspirational, then something is very wrong with you. Because that's all that song is, is positivity and inspiration. So, and, well, and another one that I know a lot of people may not see as positive and inspirational out of Eminem. And no, he did not do it on stage at the Super Bowl halftime show. Um, not afraid. For those of us who have been addicts, not afraid is inspirational and positive as hell. So please don't come with this crap that these people do nothing positive or inspirational. Because they do. And M's not the only one. The others have too. And yeah, they may have made mistakes in their past. They may have done things that a lot of us don't agree with. But does that mean they're that same person as they were when they did those things? No. It doesn't. So why do you even want to go there with that crap and want to use good God-fearing patriot kid rock to uphold your argument? <laughs> oh, that's uh, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Let, let me get to it here. Um, uh, let's see. Talking about the whole the whole thing, you know, as far as, you know, the reason a lot of people do stuff like this is for the money. You know, things like that. But, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> supposedly, and this this is uh, according to Forbes.com, Dr. Dre will not be paid for the Super Bowl halftime show. Not only will he not be paid, he spent $7 million of his own money to put that show on. Well, and, and So out of the, the $13 million budget, he spent $7 million. Hey, and see, that's another thing. <laughs> All right. Nick Adams was to claim, you know, nothing positive or inspirational about these people. Jackass, if you look at where these people came from and what they have accomplished and done with their lives, just that in and of itself is positive and inspirational. So shut the frig up. That's how you've made your name is riding somebody else's coattails. They didn't do that. They created their own way. They didn't have a politician making a name for them. They did it their on their own. And I'd say being able to shell out $7 million of your own money to put on a show. You can't suck to everybody if that's the case. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, exactly. You don't just become a multi-millionaire because you suck and everybody hates you so uh. i i just i do not understand it i i don't get it if like i said if it's not your genre that's fine but that doesn't mean that they're any less valid or any less talented 
because it's not your genre. And another thing I saw a lot of people saying that just killed me. It wasn't a good Christian show. Since when has any Super, Super Bowl halftime show been based around putting on a Christian show? Okay, your religion, no matter what it is, should not be the basis for everything in the world and for everybody else. And that is part of the problem in the world right now is everybody trying to make everybody else believe the way they do. You want to create a bunch of little clones so that everybody's the exact same. Let me tell you something. That's going to create one boring, dull-ass world where nothing is ever going to get accomplished. We'll never do anything great again. Humanity might as well die. <laughs> there was actually a... I, I didn't catch on to this until now after going through this, this story. And I hadn't heard this one mentioned, uh, so I may be adding fuel to the fire for uh, for those against the whole the whole show. But there was a line in Steel Dre that the NFL wanted him to censor out, and he refused. So what, what? Dre actually was the the uh, the one that probably should have been in the spotlight. Is it what the line I'm thinking? Still fucking with the beat, still not loving the police. Yep. I have seen a lot of people raising cane about that being said. And what people have to look at is at the time Dre wrote that song. And honestly, it's still true today. And this is coming from someone who has family members that are police officers. Friends that are police officers. There are good police and there are bad police. Okay. At the time Dre wrote... A lot of his early stuff it was at the time when we were having like the whole um, Rodney King situation go on and for those y'all who don't know what that is I will find some stuff and link that below and had like the LA rights you know and I'm sorry but it's kind of comparable to the stuff that's going on as far as George Floyd and other stuff today it's still an issue today. Pol bad police thinking they can do what they want, particularly to people of color at times. So that's what he's talking about. And that is still an issue in today's day and age. And I can tell you right now, place I used to live, I had an officer. I was getting in a little bit of trouble when I was a teenager, okay? You know. Yeah. And it, it wasn't like real trouble. It was just like not wanting to go home, out running around. Being a general little shit. Yeah. But my, my parents thought it would be a good idea to have this officer talk to me. And, um, hmm. One of the first things he said is, well, yeah, she, she's misbehaving, but at least she's not like a lot of her classmates. And went and got knocked up by a N-word. Wow. And I looked at him like, what did you say? I immediately reported him to his superiors. He ended up suspended for a little while, but is still back on the job to this day. And every chance he gets to pull me over when I go through that town, he does. And has told me point blank, it's payback for that. But my point behind this story is, is that there are still police in many parts of the country with that mentality. Dre knows it. And if everybody is honest with themselves, they know it too. At the same time, okay. on the flip side of that, there are people that so hate the police, they will, acknowledge, will not acknowledge there are good police. And I... The argument I've seen for that is, well, if they were good, they would be trying to do something about it. I have known good police that have tried to do something about it. And I saw what they went through when they did. So it's a process that's going to take time. And just my honest opinion, part of what it's going to take for those good ones to be able to make any change is for them to stay in their positions. And keep trying to change it from the inside. And all of us. Weed the bad ones out. Yes. And all <laughs> of us. Support the good ones. And. Do our damnedest to dog. And get rid of the bad ones. 
Well, it can't be everybody on one side saying all cops are bad or everybody on the other side saying all cops are good because that's just not true either way. We all have to learn to see the good and the bad, support the good, and do our damnedest to get rid of the bad. That's And, and from what, and this, this is not something that I've got a reference for. This is me talking uh, off the record, so to speak, because uh, it's hearsay. But from what I have, from what I understand, it also goes completely against the unwritten rules of, you know, having each other's back. That's, that kind of thing is great and a positive in a good situation or in a situation where somebody needs to defend it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but in a situation where you're covering up something, you're just as guilty. Yep. So, and I, I have seen cops that did that. Yeah. So I, I've seen both sides of it. I've seen the good and I've seen the bad. And the whole situation is ugly, though, because the good, they take the heat that the bad brings on them. So. And they'll be the, they'll be the first to be run off. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've because seen, they will take it to heart. I, I've seen good cops quit because of the stuff. Yeah. And the problem with that is when they quit, then that leaves just the bad eggs in there. And. Shit's, room for more of them. Yeah, shit's going to go downhill that, fast. Yeah. The, the room for more bad ones that fit the bad culture. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's a culture change. It's something that's not going to happen overnight. And what people have to realize with, like, Dre's lyrics is he grew up in an area where police were, and it's been proven. I mean, go through and do your research, y'all. Look at the history of, like, the LAPD. Go through and look at what that police department, oh, my God. They have a history of horrible, horrible, horrible crap. And it's like they don't even try to hide most of it. You know, most police departments try to be sneaky and hide it. No, not them. They don't care. That's the stuff Dre is talking about and that's the stuff that makes so many people mistrust all police so we've all got to work together to get rid of the bad to encourage the good or else it's just going to continue to go downhill for everybody so that's just kind of my thoughts on that so everybody dog and dre for his lyrics dog and m for taking an e you're entitled to your opinion, but I think you are really misinterpreting so many things. Because it's coming from either a generation or a culture that you are not familiar with. And just because you're not familiar with it doesn't mean it's not valid. And it doesn't mean it's all bad. A uh, perfect example, um, one of the news channels I follow on Facebook. Anytime they cover a story that is from another area, the first comments you see is, not local news. <laughs> I know exactly which news channel you're talking yeah. about, too. And yep. to, thi <laughs> to this news channel's credit, it doesn't make them stop covering stuff from other places. They keep doing it. And the other day was, um, they covered a news story about a 12-year-old boy who had been murdered by his mother, oh, well, his father and his stepmother. They had locked this boy in a room for years with no light, no toilet, no food. It was heartbreaking. I was bawling. And yet, the first comment out of this one, and I'm just going to call it like I see it, this one bitch. <laughs> yep, she meant that. Was sensationalized story, not local news. Okay, because it's not local news, then this little boy's life didn't matter? It's sensationalized? No, sweetheart. It mattered. This little boy mattered what was done to him mattered and it's not sensationalizing anything to make the world aware that there are shitty horrible monsters out there that would do this to a child so it kind of goes back to what we were saying with M and Dre's lyrics their actions just because it's not directly affecting you 
does not mean it is not a thing. It does not mean it's not something that doesn't need to be addressed. So that's, that's kind of where I was going with that. And that, I probably shouldn't have brought that up, but just that comment is stuck in my head for days after seeing that on an article about a 12-year-old boy being tortured and murdered by the people that should have been protecting him. That's the first thought this woman had. And to me, that just goes to show the self-absorption and the selfishness that goes on in our society. So, I was just about that. <laughs> <laughs> now, I do want to end this on something absolutely non-political, non-negative. Why would you want to do something like that? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm tired of the negativity. I want to look at one of the things I saw on that stage and that I think maybe a lot of people our age saw on that stage. Do you realize every one of those people was over 40? And yet they still commanded that audience they still put on a performance like they were in their 20s. Except for with more confidence, I would say, than what they had in their 20s. You know, a lot of them, especially Snoop, Lord, love you, Snoop. M2, love you. But both y'all in your 20s, you had more, you were more cocky than confident. This time it was more confidence. And to me, that was something great for people our age to see. Because so many people our age and younger than us expect that after we hit 40, our lives are over. We're, that's it. We're dead. We might as well just go ahead, climb in our <laughs> grave, pull the dirty in on top of us, you know. No. Hell, I didn't start college till after 40. <laughs> what are you talking about? Oh, and for the longest, I let my writing career go and didn't start it again until after 40. We started this podcast after 40. We started our company after 40. We started YouTube after 40. Twitch after 40. For those of y'all out there that are our age, and even you youngins, you youngins, listen up. Age is just a damn number. Seriously. As long as you are still doing what you are passionate about, you could be a hundred years old and I guarantee you, you'll still be doing it. You'll still be happy. You will still be rocking that shit. Just like every one of those performers did. So even after 40, we've still got a lot of life left and a lot left to give this world. So don't count us out. Don't write us off. And if there was ever any proof of that, it was every one of those performers at the halftime show. They were all proof of that. And <laughs> I'm grateful to them for proving it. So, yeah, that's just my thoughts on that. Well, on, the, on the subject of music, and this is completely off script. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe what he looked at as a a positive story or it could be looked at as a negative story. Uh, it's just all depends on how you want to look at it. But I don't know, for some reason during the conversation, somebody came to mind that uh, I decided to plug into Google and look up some things that I remembered to make sure I was right. But uh, I'll give you, I'll throw a couple of hints out there and see if you can figure it out. Um, this man had, and man, I just gave away part of it had a treasured collection of rubber ducks rubber ducks. at around a hundred of them. Huh? Yep. That's, that's the first hint. Uh, I have no clue. Y'all, I think he's done lost the plot. Mm. Bonnie Tyler's total eclipse of the heart was almost his song. Okay. I know that song very well, but I don't know. I can't picture anybody else doing that but Bonnie. <laughs> uh, let's see. A study a study found that playing his songs helped plants grow. 
Okay, when you say plants, are we talking like general health plants or a particular <laughs> kind of I, I'm herb? A, I'm assuming so. Herb or um, house plant? <laughs> later, later on, had to keep an oxygen mask backstage. Should be getting closer to getting oh, out of the way. Oh my now. God, I know exactly who you're talking about, and that's one of the things I wanted to end the show with today. Oh, well, I just blew it out of the water, but, uh, and last but not least, I'll throw out there, um, he once gave Charles Manson a lift. Picked up the hitchhiking Charles Manson after spotting, spotting him hovering around Sunset Boulevard. You can't be talking I'm about the same person me. I was thinking about. I'm talking about Meatloaf. That's who I thought. Oh, my God. According to the Bad Out of Hell singer, Manson instructed him to drive to Dennis Wilson's house where he insisted Meatloaf could meet a beach boy. There was no beach boy there, although it actually was Dennis Wilson's yeah. house. Dennis Wilson's house. Yeah, the Manson family kind of suckered Dennis Wilson in for a while and they, and they lived in his house. Um, but you bringing up Meatloaf, that was kind of how I wanted to end the show today was I wanted to... Hmm... I wanted to bring him up, and y'all, if I get emotional on this one, forgive me. I know it is silly to get upset and cry over a celebrity you've never met who never even knew you existed, but Meatloaf's music got me through so much in my life, and <laughs> when he died... It, it was like losing a piece of my life. And um, I admired his music. I admired his whole story. There there was so much about the man I sh just truly looked up to. And um, <laughs> y'all want to know the first way I ever even heard his music? It, it was really weird. Um, I was a kid. <laughs> I was driving home, and for some reason, I don't remember what it was. Something was going on in my car. I had to pull over on the side of the road. Checked my car and was getting back into the car. And I just happened to catch the glimpse of, of something out of the corner of my eye laying on the side of the road. And it was a tape. And I say tape, you know, for you kids nowadays, we didn't always have, you know, digital music. It was a <laughs> tape that you stuck in a tape deck to play. But I picked that tape up and I looked at it and it was Meatloaf, Bad Out of Hell. I stuck it in and the first song that came in, came on was Two Out of Three. And it just, from that day forward, I was a diehard fan. And then when I found out more about Meatloaf's life and his backstory, that just really cemented how much of a fan I was and the respect I had for him. So to whatever dumbass threw that tape out, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and um, just all the respect in the world to Meatloaf and his family. And all the thanks. For some really good memories and getting me through some really shitty parts of my life. So, and I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to do it. Too late. <laughs> Shush. They can't see me. <laughs> Shut up. But I think <clears throat> one of the things after his passing that hit me harder than anything, and kind of like you said, dude, you know, for somebody that you didn't even know, uh, was I was flipping through Facebook or something. I think it was Facebook. And right after his passing, I see something about somebody covering one of his songs. And it was a video of the Queen's Guard. Oh, yes. Yes. I now will insert that... part of that somewhere right in here for you guys.
Now, for a guy that wasn't supposed to be nothing, that was worthless. Yeah. You know, if for anybody that doesn't know his backstory, look it up. He was treated like utter trash, like something to throw in the garbage as a kid. Uh, meatloaf wasn't just something he came up with. No. Um, it was supposed to be an insult and a cut down and to make him feel horrible about himself. And he took it and ran with it. That's uh, strength and that's character, y'all. Yeah, I believe, if, and don't quote me on this, but I believe it was his own father that named him Meat. Yeah. And then uh, was it a gym teacher or somebody? Somebody in school that added the loaf to the end of it. I, I will right. see if I can find links to both the movie about his life and the book that he wrote about his life and link them in the description. Um, you ne Y'all need to watch them. Watch the movie. You need to read the book. It's it's an amazing story. And the closest I've ever come to a celebrity death hitting me as hard as his did was actually a celebrity I actually did know, Mr. McDonald. Um, for those of y'all who may not know, he, he wrote Fletch, The Brave, starring Johnny Depp. Um, he he was my, my writing mentor from the time I was in eighth grade on. And um, when he died, uh, Michael could tell you, it kind of, that kind of crushed me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and that's about the way I felt when I found out about Meatloaf. It was, it was hard. It was real hard. So. Yeah, just a, <laughs> you know, just a story of, a, of somebody that comes from that. That's never supposed to be anything that that lives the life he did. He wasn't perfect by any means. I mean, don't get me wrong there. No, nobody's Nobody perfect. Is. But to go from that to having the Queen's Guard cover your song at Buckingham Palace is, that's that's a pretty big shot from where he started, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, it tells, like you said, a lot about his character, a lot about his strength. Uh, and, he, I mean, he was a master of, of what he done of arrangements of you know putting theatricals together uh, I, I don't think anybody will ever touch you know what he done in his own right you know no i guess you would say no and and we lost a good one we lost him i i think the only two musicians i've ever looked at on the level that i looked at him on was of course him and prince and him and Prince had, even though they were from two totally different backgrounds, had so much in common when it came to how they treated other people, how they performed, how they wrote. It, you know, both of them, their lyrics, without even hearing the music or hearing them sing them, you could just read the lyrics and you could picture everything they were saying. It, it could touch you in a way. And not a lot of songwriters or writers of any kind can do that, to be honest. And then you add in their musical genius. And then you add in their theatrics on stage. Just two superpower talents that it's a damn shame we had to lose. And and with, with Prince, to add to his... Uh... <clears throat> To add to his talents and abilities, it's something I noticed we were listening to a performance of his a little while ago. But something I noticed out of that performance, uh, in a couple of spots, one major spot was during Purple Rain, where he comes in on guitar. It's one of the nastiest, raunchiest sounding distortions I think I've ever heard. And I mean, it's just, it, it, at first hearing it, it sounds like somebody playing in a garage. It just sounds mm -hmm. nasty. And he's well into the first notes before it ever starts to click where it's going. And it's like, that was awesome. That was genius. 
Yeah. Yes. Initially, it sounds all off and horrible, and then builds into something just within within you know a second. Yep. And it's like, where did that come? That's not where you just started. You know. <laughs> And well, I, that's that's not something that can be taught. That's something that's that you've got it or you don't, in my opinion. And Prince and Meatloaf both had it mm-hmm. in spades. And Meatloaf, it goes back to Meatloaf as well. He was the same way. If you listen to his timings, it's like, dude, where are you uh-huh. going with this? And then click. It would all fall together. Paradise yep. by the Dashboard Light is a perfect example of that. Mm-hmm. It, and just, it would suddenly click. Everything fell into place. And it's like everybody on stage is doing their own thing until this one split second when, bam, everybody's back together. And it's like, okay, you meant to do that. Now, I, <laughs> I will say one thing that aggravated me with Meatloaf's death was all I saw anybody want to talk about or post about was i do anything for love. Yes, it was a beautiful, brilliant song, but it was not... I repeat, not his only song. <laughs> so if that is the only song you knew of his, you are not a fan. Shh, just zip it. <laughs> if that's the only song you knew, you're not a fan. I'm sorry. And he, yes, like I said, it was a beautiful, brilliant, epic song. But he had others that, in my opinion, were better. So if that's the only one you knew, no, you did not feel his loss like those of... <laughs> The others of us did. Okay, so psh, zip. Sorry. That just aggravated me so bad. <laughs> it was like this man has so many brilliant works and this is the only one everybody wants to talk about. It That's like diminishing everything else he did when he did so much great stuff. Just like so many people with Prince. All they want to talk about is one or two songs. People, he did so much more and he wrote songs for other people that a lot of y'all probably don't even know he was the one who wrote them. (laughs) Come on. Okay, zip it, Mandy. Just just get over it. (laughs) Get past it. Uh, Guys, we do need to go ahead and wrap this one up, I guess. It's great to be back. We are going to try our very best to make sure that there's not that long a pause again. Um, but guys, like we said, there's been a lot of life changes, a lot of big changes for us, a lot of big changes coming. So now more than ever, we kind of need your support. So d- do us a favor, listen on wherever you listen to podcast, watch on YouTube, like, subscribe, share, tell your friends, spread the word, check out our other channels, all those good things, because A lot of what we have planned to do is really going to depend on you guys' help, to be honest. Um, I mean, and we've got some really big plans that, like I said, we don't want to just benefit us or our families. We want to use them to benefit others, particularly people in the gaming world, in the online world. Um. Like, like I said, people that just need that extra little something. Yeah. So that yeah, it's kind of a, I don't know, it's kind of, if we can, we can make this thing fly, then try to hand up for others that are in the same, you know, it, same area that we're in now. So exactly. And, um, Miss mm-hmm. Grid, Mr. Darth, if y'all are listening, we're going to have to have a meeting real soon. Um, Mr. Charlie Rocket, if you happen to hear this, I uh, got something coming your way real soon. So, yeah, there's just a lot going on. And, guys, one other thing. I had this idea, something I kind of wanted to do. Um, ain't got nothing to do with this one time at band camp, does it? No, not, not this time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, y'all just. If if you happen to be a fan of Mr. Rich Lux, h- head over there and tell him, you know, that they, that thing I told him about would be a good idea. Just put it that way. <laughs> Rich, don't kill me. Don't kill me. I'm sorry. Don't kill me. And uh, Shay, I still need um, some more of that info so we can get your biography done. So, 
yeah, lots going on, lots coming, coming you guys' way. We just really need all the support and love you can give us right now. And trust me, it will not go unnoticed. And we are eternally grateful for any and all of it. Absolutely. Any and all over love will be accepted. <laughs> <laughs> I think I just created some a uh, word or phrase there. Uh, over love. Yeah, that's a little. I don't think I've ever heard that one before. I don't know. It almost sounds kinky. Uh, it kind of does. Let's Google it. <laughs> y'all, I, I promise uh, we're not trying to like you know molest any of y'all. I promise. The meaning of over love is to love is to love to excess. Okay, there we go. There and we go. Merriam did, where Merriam Webster already had it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, and here I was thinking I'd created some new language for the, you know, the English language, but nah, no. Nah. Oh, there was one other thing I wanted to mention in this podcast, and I almost forgot. I do apologize. Uh, a lot of y'all know we do have, we have taken issue with a lot of things with Ethan Klein, but however, him and his beautiful wife, Ela, and the issues I may have with Ethan, I've always adored her, so, <laughs> but they just had another beautiful son, so congratulations to y'all on a beautiful, healthy, happy baby boy. Spoil him as much as I know you guys have the other one, so, yeah, congrats to them, but that's it. I think we're going to head out for now. I think we've yacked y'all's ear off, you know. When Are we you just finally going to hush? I might. We decide to come back. I guess we decide to come back big because I'm looking at this. We've been recording for, um, well, in 20 minutes, it'll be two hours. So. Well, I agree. You just don't know when to <laughs> shut up sometimes. No. Y'all, if you don't hear from him again, you know what you happens. You know what happens. Yep. You know what happens. So this is my proof. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right guys we will have another episode out for y'all soon as well as some new content coming to the to the podcast channel and i'm not going to say what that is just yet y'all will just be surprised when you get it all right thanks for hanging out guys much love to all of y'all and we will talk to y'all soon bye guys peace